nine parents whose daughters were among those abducted by Boko Haram blame President Goodluck Jonathan for failing to bring back their girls. In our Music Maker segment, three voices of women from the Ivory Coast and Cameroon. Sexy, enchanting, touching. The most anticipated original movies of 2015 have something for everyone. Africa 54 starts right now. Hello and welcome. I'm Vincent McCorry. This is Africa 54. More than eight months after the abduction of around 270 schoolgirls in northeastern Nigeria, the girls' parents are now appealing to the United Nations to help return their daughters safely. They say they have lost faith in the Nigerian government ability or willingness to help them res rescue their girls who were kidnapped from the northeastern town of Chibok, Borno State, in April 2014 by Boko Haram militants. Some of the parents gathered in the Nigerian capital, Abuja, on Thursday to restate their resolve. This would involve, uh, as a community, writing the, the, the president, escalating it. We would engage the UN, would also write letters to the United Nations and, and protest this neglect and, 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 and nonchalance uh, by the government of the Federal Republic towards the Chibok people and the abducted girls. Well, a ceasefire with Boko Haram brokered by Chad that would also have seen the girls release fell apart in November after a man claiming to be militant leader Abu Bakr Shekau denied the deal in a video adding that the girls had been married off. While well, forces loyal to the president of Gambia are going house to house in the capital Banjul in search of opponents uh, res responsible for the armed attack on his presidential palace. Uh, president Yahya Jami blamed the attack earlier this week on terrorist groups outside the country. This wasn't a coup. This was an attack by a terrorist, uh, terrorist group backed by some powers that I will not name now. Uh, but of course we know where the dissidents are based. Well, the president was out of the country at the time of Tuesday's incident. The French news agency quotes a Gambian intelligence source as saying that dozens of Mr. Jamais' political opponents have been arrested, interrogated and jailed. The government has not publicly confirmed that information. Kenya's High Court on Friday suspended some anti-terrorism measures signed into law two weeks ago by President Uhuru Kenyatta. This is a partial victory for opposition groups who had argued they threatened basic liberties and free speech. In December, Kenya's parliamentary chamber descended into chaos over amendments to the security bill as police outside the building violently arrested uh, activ uh, activists. Uh, the ruling is a setback for Kenyatta, who has faced mounting pressure to boost security since Somali al-Shabaab rebels killed 67 people in a Nairobi shopping mall in September 2013. Well, for more, we're joined live via Skype from Nairobi by VOS East Africa correspondent Gabe Joslo. Gabe, now, what is the implication of the court's ruling today? Well, uh, as you mentioned, it's a bit of a victory for the opposition and for rights groups who have been denouncing this security law as a real violation of Kenyans' rights. Uh, the law itself uh, was enacted by the president to combat terrorism, but a lot of people just say that it goes too far by limiting a lot of freedoms, by granting sweeping powers to the police, uh, and putting a lot of restrictions on the media. Now, uh, so what happened? very yes. specifically, what are some of those measures that, that restrict the freedoms and, and also uh, free speech? Well, some of the measures that were suspended today included one that uh, would have given uh, the police the power to detain suspects for up to 360 days without charge. Another one uh, that was suspended would impose very harsh penalties on uh, the media, on media houses that broadcast images that the government thinks are offensive. Uh, and then there was yet another measure uh, that would have restricted the number of refugees uh, who can stay in Kenya um, at 150,000, which is far below the number that are already residing in the country. So what next? So now the law is uh, going to be considered, the challenge is going to be considered at another uh, hearing a three-judge hearing. The date has not yet been set, so there will be another chance for uh, the judiciary to review this law, uh, whether it was passed constitutionally and whether the actual provisions within it uh, can, you know, uh, are, are, are uh, agree with the Kenyan constitution as well. So, but otherwise, both parties do agree that there is a need for a security bill that will ensure uh, that the government can deal with terrorists, isn't it? 
It's true. There is definitely a, a strong, you know, strong statements from from all parties involved, the opposition as well as the ruling party, that something has to be done to first of all enforce the existing laws uh, to crack down on some of the corruption and some of the loopholes that are allowing terrorists and criminals to operate in the country, uh, and also to you know beef up security in areas that are the most vulnerable. Uh, generally, how do things feel like in Nairobi anyway since uh, the last attacks in Mombasa? Uh, it's been pretty quiet in Nairobi. I mean, we just got through the holiday season, uh, and you know there have been attacks during the holidays in recent years, uh, but the city was pretty quiet. There hasn't really been much since uh, the attacks in Mandera, uh, which uh, killed some quarry workers and some people on uh, on a bus uh, traveling to Nairobi. So, uh, so since then, it's been a, a bit calm. But you never know. You know, the nature of terrorism is that it can really strike at any time. Well, Gabe, thank you very much. Uh, for your reporting there. That's uh, Gabe Josler reporting live from Nairobi. Well, Italian crews have taken control of a cargo ship carrying hundreds of migrants abandoned by smugglers in the Mediterranean. A video released Friday shows rescuers being lowered uh, into the ship late Thursday as the vessel was being uh, towed to Italy. The crew had abandoned the Sierra Leone flagged ship believed to be heading to Turkey. On Wednesday, Italian sailors intercepted a freighter carrying several hundred migrants that had been drifted on autopilot towards the rocks of Italy's southeastern shore. Where well, such crews from at least five nations are now involved in the search for the Air Asia flight that crashed into the Java Sea Sunday, a key goal is to retrieve the jet's data and voice recorders. Uh, through Friday, the bodies of 30 of the 162 uh, people aboard the Airbus jet have been recovered. One Indonesian official warned it could take at least a week before the plane and its crucial cockpit voice and flight data recorders are found in the waters near Borneo Island. While most of us like salt in our food, uh, perhaps a little too much, but do you know where salt comes from? Well, Africa 54's Paul Ndiho visited a region of Uganda to find out. Paul? Uh, thanks, uh, Vincent. Uh, for centuries, uh, people near Lake Katwe in uh, western Uganda have mined salt by hand. And salt mining remains their only means of livelihood. I recently visited uh, the salt mine in uh, the heart of Queen Elizabeth National Park. Salt mining is one of Uganda's uh, oldest uh, industries that are still surviving. Mining has played a significant uh, political and economic role in uh, the history of uh, Katwe area in western Uganda. Today, Uganda spends billions of dollars importing salt from other countries, following the collapse of the salt factory built in the 70s. Critics of the government uh, say the country needs uh, to revive uh, the Katwe salt factory to boost a local salt production and reduce its import bill. More than 75% of the population earn a living from mining salt here. Uh, they are not allowed to do any other activity because it's in the middle of a national park. So the only activity that can be done here is mining. Salt traders come from nearby markets in Uganda and from other countries. But salt production has rapidly turned from boom to bust with the seasons, leaving the workers are struggling to make ends meet. Josh Kimulia is a tour guide affiliated with the Katwe Tourism Information Center. These are the main main features around Lake Katwe and they are called salt pans and within the pans is where salt forms naturally. Okay. And pans are owned individually by Ghanans. You own a pan like you own land at home, it's your property. Extraction of the salt from Lake Katwe is done by hand, by both men and women. The work is back-breaking, but this is the only trade here in Katwe. Notwithstanding, salt extraction has been a source of prosperity for decades, but today's miners work in appalling conditions. That fume from brine is dangerous to ladies. Yeah, ladies. It, if it, it can disturb her reproductive system. That's why ladies have been advised to pad before they enter there. And for men who go for rock salt mining from the main lake also have got a very big problem because once a man's 
penis. Once it lands on concentrated brine, it itches terribly. Despite the challenges, salt miners are able to make a good money and live comfortable lives outside of the salt lake. Crispus Magonza is one of the miners and he has spent all his life here at the lake. We mine every week. We, we produce salt in the, in, the, in the dry season. We continue until when, until when it is the, again it is rainy season. Birunji Powell has been working as a professional salt loader for years. He says that on average he loads about four trucks of salt a day. I am here as a loader. Uh -huh. I load whatever vehicle comes in here. Uh -huh. It's a group of 100 people. We do the same activity of loading whatever vehicle comes in. Uh -huh. And we are licensed by government. Uh, we load the, the salt yield from Katwe has dwindled in recent years and became more unpredictable because of Uganda's increasingly uncertain climate. Climate scientists are predicting that weather patterns in Uganda will shift as a result of global warming, resulting into much rain and not enough evaporation to produce salt. Well, uh, 2014 was a busy year for me. I traveled quite a bit from West Africa to Southern Africa and then to East Africa. But perhaps it was even more exciting for young Africans venturing into leadership positions, entrepreneurship, innovation and technology. Well, thanks a lot, Paul. Indeed, you did quite a bit in 2014. And talking about the young Africans, you know, the year started somewhere in the middle of it with a, a very exciting time in Washington when you had uh, how many Yali fellows um, invited to the United States congregating here in Washington. I think that was really a show of uh, Af Africa's present and future, isn't it? Absolutely. I think that was one of the best things that probably happened to young Africans uh, on the continent. Uh, everywhere I went, uh, people were making reference uh, of the Yali 2014 and how, how much of an impact it had on the continent. Yes, so just to make it clear, Young African Leaders uh, Initiative, uh, for those who may not remember what that is. Mm. So this brought in like young innovators, entrepreneurs in, into the United States to learn skills on management and uh, entrepreneurship. But basically it's because they're already doing what on the continent? I mean, <laughs> some of the guys that came over here, rather some of the young leaders that came to, the, uh, to Washington here or to the United States uh, were part of the brightest and the future leaders of Africa. So uh, they literally looked around for people who had the skills, people who are into uh, leadership positions, people who are into entrepreneurship, uh, innovation and technology. Those are the big, big things happening on the continent. And uh, I think uh, some of these young uh, kids have realized that, you know what, it's not going to take the government. Uh, giving us employment. These people are going out creating their own jobs and that's what I found fascinating uh, throughout my travels on the and, continent. And actually the Yali fellows were just a, a small representation of thousands of kids across the continent or young people uh, who never got the opportunity to come. The, it was a very rigorous uh, process but as you traveled around and did a number of stories can you mention a few very specific cases of uh, young people you met who are doing amazing things on the continent? Uh, I mean, the one remarkable guy maybe I can point to was a young guy in Malawi, uh, Mixon Falwaki. This is a guy who invented uh, a Padoka charger. Uh, this young man, I met him on Facebook, and that was the first time I interacted with him, and I followed him up, I befriended him. So I went to Malawi looking for him. Uh, he had created this uh, great, great uh, innovation uh, that uses a, uh, a, a dynamo to charge a phone. So somehow he configured, he managed how to make it into a charger. And that's what was uh, interesting about him. And later on, he went and competed at an international level and won the competition. So he was one of the, he was voted the best among all innovations, uh, he was voted the, the best uh, candidate. Yeah, and, and, and so we have uh, innovations in all areas. We have kids who are doing a lot in uh, uh, IT, uh, but there are others who are also kind of even working in the areas of agriculture, uh, trying to figure out the best way uh, to transform uh, 
uh, you know, doing business in Africa, agriculture in Africa, is right? Yes. Uh, you know, what is interesting is that uh, people have realized that uh, uh, th there are projections out there that the population of Africa is going to grow exponentially, maybe by 2050. Uh, most countries are projecting that the populations of those countries are going to double, yeah. and everybody wants food or needs food. So most people who are smart are actually venturing into agriculture, and I think agriculture is going to be the big thing uh, uh, come 2015 well, and going forward. Everybody's going to need yeah. food. But I think one of the other key things we observe throughout the year, and which might be manifest even as we move forward, is that the young Africans are not waiting for governments to do things for them. Of course, they're calling out and hoping that the government can create and build the infrastructure that will help them build uh, the kind of businesses and futures that they desire. But they're not waiting. Uh, you're right on the money, Vincent. I think uh, from Southern Africa to yeah. North Africa to East Africa, everybody is aspiring to be the next big thing. That's they're right. saying, you know what, we need to create our own jobs, and they've figured out how to create their own jobs. Great. Thank you very much, Paul. And uh, we definitely have a lot to look forward to in this uh, year, 2015. Now, we want to know what you think about Africa 54 and the stories we covered during the conversation on Facebook. The address is Africa 54. And check out our headlines 24-7 on voaafrica.com. Coming up, music with a woman's touch, the beautiful sound of acoustic Africa. Stay with us. to present music and a side of American culture that is most important to me, that is a part of who I am. They're gonna get some incredible performances. That's one of the things I love, bringing these artists in so you can get to see them do what they do. It's soul music and that's what music is. It's that which comes from the soul. Hamilton Live is a live audience performance. With live music, you have that interaction. There's nothing like getting that immediate feedback from the folks that you're performing to. They feel it and they respond back to you. You see it in their eyes. You know that you're connecting with them. Like if any form of communication, it's that response that you get back. Welcome back, it's Music Makers Friday, and today we bring back a group we featured once before, the Acoustic Africa Three. This is a trio of African female musicians. A while ago, they performed for Music Time in Africa host, Heather Maxwell. Welcome, Heather. Thank you. That was you. such a beautiful performance there, eh? That was a beautiful performance, and it's one of our listeners' and viewers' favorite ones. Yes. Yeah. And you tell me something about one of those singers? The one in the middle, her name is Dobe Nyahore. She's from Côte d'Ivoire. And she has a brand new album out. It's not even released yet. It will be released in January 13th. Yeah. It's her fourth one. And she's coming on tour uh, here in Washington okay. next week. Wow. And That's I can't cool. wait. Yeah, I can't wait to see her. So I mean, let's go back and uh, just get a taste of what they left us with and see what we can look forward to. Great. Let's watch this video. Sous ce qu'il y a comme qu'il y a comme il m'appelle N'appelle ni polo manaka na comme biso Na sous ce qu'il m'a molé li calendi na kaunda na bolidi Oh, 
Say something very special about the girl in the middle. Eh? The one in the middle, Dobe, the one who's coming, she's special number one. She's from Cote d'Ivoire and part of my family is from uh, Cote d'Ivoire. Right. But also, she's a Grammy Award winner. Oh, sure. And she's an amazing dancer and mover. Yeah. She's a percussionist. Wow. So she plays, she dances, she sings, she does everything. And she's coming, she's going to do all that on stage. And I know she's going to mesmerize everybody. And I'm going to bring some of that footage back for you and all of our listeners. Please do that, and I hope here. someday we can uh, kind of uh, make a, get to bring her here and have a perform for us. I tried, Maybe. Vincent. I tried yeah. this time, but she was too busy. She was too busy. She'll come. That's yeah. Uh, as, where exactly are they performing here? For anybody They're performing know. at the Barnes at the Wolf Trap in okay. Virginia. Yeah. Virginia, yeah. That's just, just Dobe and her group. Her group is yeah. a mix of African musicians and European musicians mm -hmm. because she's lived in Europe for 15 years, and it's a real blend of, of traditional and European sounds. So she kind of travels between the, you know, the three corners of uh, the earth, uh, Africa, Europe, and America? Or yeah. where is she based? She's based in Europe. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah, and that's good. She looks like she's imbibing the influences from all over, but still retaining the African identity. Exactly, but it's really African identity because yeah. she's singing in seven different languages. Wow. She uses Amazing. styles from all over, yeah. some from her own region, but yeah. she's really a pan-Africanist, and like you said, from all three corners of the world, that's, exactly. that's what she represents. We look forward to uh, your videos from her performances in you got the it. coming weeks. You got it. Wow, thanks about Heather. And so much, uh, we want to thank you very much for that uh, fantastic music maker segment, and to learn more about Heather Maxwell and our VOA show, uh, visit Facebook and type in the keywords Music Time in Africa and you can see what time our radio program can be heard in your area and get more information about some of our featured artists. Well, it's time now for a short break still to come on Africa 54, a roundup of some of the most anticipated original movies of 2015. We'll be right back. You know that all these weapons, some of these things were uh, some of the materials are US made that they have. And of course also we have a comprehensive plan that they have been planning. Welcome back to Africa 54. Here's what's trending. Among an array of sequels and spin-offs being released this year, there are some original films which are expected to cause a star in 2015. The widely anticipated big screen adaptation of the international best-selling novel Fifty Shades of Grey by E.L. James starts the new year off uh, with a bang. Now, the film follows college graduate Anastasia Steele as she begins a relationship with a businessman, uh, Christian Grey. However, as their relationship develops, so too do the extremes of their sex lives. The movie is set for worldwide release from February the 13th. 
Well, if you're looking for kid-appropriate viewing, how about a classic uh, fairy tale of, uh, brought to life? Cinderella, the story of the girl who overcomes harsh treatment from her stepmother and uh, stepsisters and marries a, a prince, was directed by Kenneth uh, Branagh. Uh, the film stars Kate Blanchett as the wicked stepmother, Helena Bonham, Keta, as the fairy god, uh, godmother, Richard Madden as Prince Charming, and Lily James as Cinderella or Ella. Uh, the movie is scheduled to be released on March the 13th. Well, running off uh, the list of big uh, hitters is a film from Africa. Chappie is a science fiction film directed by District 9 director Neil Blockham. Uh, the movie centers on Chappie, a robot with feelings who is kidnapped by local gangsters. Chappie stars Hugh Jackman, Dave Patel, and Sigourney Weaver, as well as uh, Ninja and Yolandi Weiser from the rap group The Anti World. Chappie is scheduled for release in March 6th. And that is what is trending today. Well, it's time now for our sunny side of sports, and today, Sunny has something special for you. Happy New Year, Vincent, and Happy New Year to our Africa 54 viewers. Here in Washington, the puck dropped for a very unique sporting event on New Year's Day. That fan is showing off tickets for the Winter Classic at Nationals Park. Now, Nationals Park is the home of the Washington Nationals Major League Baseball team, but for one day, the park was transformed into a big outdoor ice hockey rink. The seventh annual Winter Classic featured the Washington Capitals hosting the Chicago Blackhawks. More than 42,000 fans packed the park for the game, which is said to net millions of dollars in ticket sales, television advertising, and memorabilia for the National Hockey League. And for the record, the hometown favorites, the Capitals, won the game with a tie-breaking goal with about 12 seconds left in the Winter Classic here in Washington. Final score, Washington Capitals 3, Chicago Blackhawks 2. Go Capitals! I'm VOA Sonny Young, and that's the sunny side of sports. Vincent? What, a very, what an exciting start for you, Sonny, this uh, 2015. <laughs> well, thanks, and be sure to watch for Sunny Side of Sports every Monday and Friday right here. Africa 54. Well, that's our show for today. Be sure to watch Africa 54 on our website at voaafrica.com. Uh, for more news, tune in to VOA's evening radio show, African News Tonight at 1800 UTC. And in the mornings today, break Africa between 0300 and 0600 UTC, Monday through Friday. Thanks a lot for watching. From all of us here in Washington, have a good night. Ebola is not a curse or spiritual infection. It is a deadly disease, a fever spread by contact with the body fluids of infected people. I am Dr. Conde Greaves. Its symptoms start with a fever, fatigue, and muscle pain. Within a few days, vomiting and diarrhea sets in, and victims lose about four liters of body fluid each day. Ebola is highly infectious. If you experience any of these symptoms, seek medical help immediately. You must wash your hands regularly. Do not eat or handle bushmeat. Stay away from people suffering from Ebola. And do not handle the bodies of Ebola victims. If you have had contact with someone who has Ebola, you need to have your temperature monitored daily for any change. Early diagnosis and treatment is critical to your survival. Learn the facts about Ebola. Knowledge is life.